Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Barry and Honey Sherman? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing by this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Barry Sherman was born in Toronto, Canada on February 25, 1942. His father had a small ownership interest in a zipper company. He died from a congenital heart defect when Barry was 10 years old. Barry's mother became an occupational therapist after her husband died in order to support the family. This is the job that she had before Barry was born. In 1958, Barry signed up for the Canadian Army Student Militia but didn't last long there because he did not like authority. He enrolled at the University of Toronto and studied engineering. Barry worked during the summer for a pharmaceutical company owned by his uncle, Lou Winter. It was called Empire Laboratories. Barry graduated in 1964 and then went to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. In 1967, he earned a PhD in astrophysics. He had hopes of working in NASA but did not launch his career in that direction because he wanted to be his own boss. He would get the opportunity to do so through an unusual circumstance. Barry's uncle, Lou Winter, had died in 1965 at the age of 41. He had a brain aneurysm. Barry and his business partner were able to buy Lou Winter's pharmaceutical company from the estate for $250,000. In 1971, Barry married a woman named Honey, the couple went on to have four children. In 1972, Barry sold Empire Laboratories for $2 million. The next year, he started another drug company called Apotex. This company became extremely successful. Eventually, it was earning $1.5 billion a year in revenue. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. Barry and Honey Sherman lived in a 12,000 square foot house located at 50 Old Colony Road in North York, Ontario, Canada. In 2017, they decided to sell this house and build a 16,000 square foot house closer to downtown Toronto. I guess 12,000 square feet was starting to feel a bit cramped. They listed the house on Old Colony Road for sale at a price of $7 million, even though the new house had not yet been built. On December 12, 2017, Honey Sherman missed a board meeting for a foundation she belonged to. This was out of the ordinary. She was contacted by email about what happened. She responded by indicating she was dealing with some stuff. On December 13, Barry and Honey had a meeting at the headquarters of Apotex. They were working on the design of the new house they were building. Honey Sherman left first and arrived home. Not long after this, Barry left work and made his way home. It wasn't unusual for Barry to make several business-related phone calls at night because he had trouble sleeping, but on the evening of December 13, he did not make any calls. On December 14, Barry was supposed to be at Apotex, but he never showed up. This was extremely unusual. He rarely missed work. Barry and Honey were not supposed to be in their house on December 15. At 8.30 a.m., a cleaning crew used a lockbox to make entry into the couple's house. At about 10 a.m., two real estate agents arrived at the house. They had a couple with them who wanted to see the property. After taking a tour of the first and second floor, one of the real estate agents led the way as the party moved downstairs to the basement. There was a pool and a hot tub installed in the basement. On the floor next to the pool, the agent spotted the bodies of 75-year-old Barry and 70-year-old Honey. She was not exactly sure what was going on. The agent did not immediately realize that the couple was dead, but she knew that something was very wrong. She quickly turned to the couple and the other real estate agent and said, Oh, I am sorry. They are doing yoga. We will come back. She pushed the group back upstairs. The agent then asked a cleaning person to go down into the basement. The cleaning person came back a few minutes later and said, Call the police. The agent did not immediately call the police. When she finally did, it was 11.43 a.m., almost 90 minutes after she discovered the bodies. 
The police were notified. Here's what they found during the course of their investigation. Barry and Honey had been dead for at least a day. Leather belts were around their necks. The belts were attached to a stainless steel railing for the pool, which was mounted about three feet from the floor. Both deaths were caused by ligature neck compression. Both of their backs were toward the pool. They were both wearing coats, which were pulled down over their shoulders, restricting the movement of their arms. Barry was in a seated position. His right leg was crossed over his left leg. His eyeglasses were positioned properly on his face. Barry had injuries to his neck, but no other injuries on his body. Honey was on her side. There was a bruise on her face. Her cell phone was found in a powder room on the first floor that she rarely used. Inspection papers for the house and Barry's gloves were found near the garage door. The basement door was unlocked, which was not unusual. A window had been left open because a room had recently been painted. Initially, the police thought that Barry had murdered Honey before bringing an end to his own life. This theory was supported by the fact that Honey sustained a facial injury and Barry did not. About six weeks after the murders, the police abandoned this theory and came to believe that the crime was a double homicide. Furthermore, they believed that the Shermans were killed in a targeted attack. There was damage to the victim's hands consistent with zip ties. Perhaps whoever killed them removed the restraints after the murders. There was evidence suggesting that Honey was murdered on the first floor of the house and her body was moved to the basement. Barry was not in good physical condition. It seems unlikely he could have moved his wife, who weighed 170 pounds. Barry had made a number of enemies, which left the police in a tough position. There were a lot of people who had a motive to kill Barry, something that Barry himself had acknowledged. Barry once said that he was surprised his murder had not happened yet. Right before the murders, Barry was awarded $300,000 in legal fees from his cousin, the cousin admitted that he had fantasized about killing Barry, specifically by decapitating him and rolling his head down the parking lot of Apotex. The cousin denied committing the murder. I think the denial would be more convincing without the part about the head rolling down the parking lot. Two weeks before the homicides, Barry had asked his son to repay a loan for tens of millions of dollars. Barry owed about a billion dollars to various companies which he claimed he was never going to pay. In November of 2020, the police said that they had identified a person of interest, but two days later they said it could actually be multiple people. In December of 2021, the police released video surveillance to the public. The video featured a person dressed in dark clothing walking down a sidewalk. The police said that the video was taken in the Sherman's neighborhood around the time the murders occurred. The person was walking toward the Sherman's residence, the police said that the person was captured on video walking the other way as well. The person was identified as a suspect by the police, and the authorities wanted help from the public to identify them. They described the person as being between 5 foot 6 and 5 foot 9. At the time making this video, the case of Barry and Honey Sherman has not been solved. Here's what the police believe happened. This is their theory. On December 13, 2017, Honey Sherman arrived home sometime between 8 and 8.30 p.m. and was confronted by a killer or multiple killers. She was strangled on the first floor and her body was moved to the basement. At some point during the attack, she had tried to call for help, which is why her phone was found in a powder room on the first floor. Barry left Apotex at about 8.30 p.m. After arriving home, he was attacked near the garage door which explains why the inspection report and his gloves were found in that area. The killer or killers positioned the bodies of the victims next to the pool in the basement. They placed the belts around their necks, coats around their shoulders, and Barry's glasses neatly on his face. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one, Barry Sherman had a lot of enemies. He built a 4.7 billion dollar net worth by using a number of less than ethical tactics. There were a few people that thought that Barry was generous and a good person, but in general, most people who knew him did not feel that way. One person described him as the only person I've ever met with no redeeming features whatsoever. 
a law professor who knew Barry called him a deplorable human being, and a reporter once said that Barry's competitors used unprintable language to describe him. Barry was considered a workaholic who was always thinking about business. He had insomnia, and his mind never stopped calculating and planning. He wasn't a big fan of small talk. He always wanted to discuss business. When Barry went on vacation and his wife was enjoying herself, he would always be working. As far as Barry's philosophy of life, he did not believe in God, free will, altruism, or morality. He viewed it as his mission in life to make all the money he could and do whatever he wanted. Barry believed that he was always right. Many of Barry's business dealings were shady. For example, Barry owned a number of companies which may have been fraudulent, like a yacht chartering company that never bought any yachts, and a nutritional supplement company. He was also accused of price fixing. Barry did business with a number of people who were later convicted of crimes, like fraud. From an outside perspective, Barry appeared to be astoundingly generous. For example, he donated $50 million to charity and often loaned money to friends and employees. This seemed inconsistent with his life philosophy, specifically how he did not believe in altruism. There may have been an ulterior motive for Barry's generosity. He took a tax credit on the donations to various foundations and then borrowed the money back from the foundations using a loophole in the law. Barry was extremely competitive and litigious. He frequently filed lawsuits against competitors and the government. During his career, he filed about 1,200 lawsuits. He was considered the most active litigant in any industry in Canada. Barry always drove ordinary vehicles. He never had a luxury vehicle or a sports car, even though many of his business associates and some of his employees did. He didn't like the message that driving a nice car sent to his workers. On his 50th birthday, his wife bought him a sports car and presented it to him in front of a group of people. He made her return the vehicle. Item number two, when considering Barry's background, what is his potential personality profile? Barry appeared to be average in openness to experience, high in conscientiousness, low in extroversion, low in agreeableness, and low in neuroticism. He may have had some dark triad traits, that is, characteristics of psychopathy, narcissism, and Machiavellianism. The trait that really stands out would be the Machiavellianism. Barry was cynical, calculating, strategic, had good impulse control, goal-oriented, deceitful, careful about how much information he shared, took pleasure in the misfortune of others, always talked about business, and had a negative view of people. When somebody is Machiavellian and high in conscientiousness, their chances of being successful in business are greatly increased. Item number three, the Shermans had a life-size sculpture in their house, which they were storing for friends. It was made of junk and designed this way on purpose, like the sculptor deliberately sought out junk to build it. It featured two people in a position similar to the way the Shermans were found. Perhaps the killer was inspired by this work of art, and that's why he staged the body in the way that he did. Whoever designed the junk sculpture probably wanted it to inspire people. I guess they were successful. Moving to item number four. The people that were being shown the house by the real estate agents were mad when the tour was cut short. This was, of course, before they were told about the homicides. When people take a tour of a house that's for sale, they are often asked to fill out a survey about how well the house showed. I was wondering what these people put on their survey. Perhaps something like, I thought the house was staged beautifully, but fewer bodies being staged would have improved the experience. Item number five, the video of the man walking down the snowy sidewalk in the Sherman's neighborhood was not particularly helpful. I think the police should have released it because there's always a chance that somebody will recognize the suspect, but ultimately, it really didn't seem like a game changer. There's no way to tell if the person is male or female, there is no clear view of their face, and there's nothing really distinctive about them that stands out. The police said that the person had an unusual gait, but they may have been walking differently because they were on snow. Essentially, the only thing that the video tells the public is that the suspect was about 5'6 to 5'9 
and was able to walk. It's not clear what type of breakthrough the police were hoping for with this video. Maybe they imagined something like a waitress finishing up a shift at a restaurant. She is cleaning some plates off of a table when she gazes up at the TV and sees this video of the walking person. She pauses for a moment and says to herself, I'm remembering something important now. I once knew somebody who was five foot six, and now that I think about it, they also walked. At least the video of the walking person is not as bad as the notorious egg with a toupee sketch from the Madeline McCann case. That must have been the worst clue ever released in the history of law enforcement. For example, they didn't even tell us if the egg could walk. Item number six, what do I think happened in the case of Barry and Honey Sherman? This is just a theory, my opinion. Barry aggravated thousands of people during his life. Much of the irritation he caused was around costing people money. Eventually, someone decided to kill him simply out of anger. The killer was probably male. He went to Barry's house personally or hired a killer. Honey Sherman was not the target. She was murdered simply as a matter of convenience. The killer wanted to get into the house undetected, therefore he attacked the first person who came home. This explains why there was no forced entry. Honey Sherman was attacked as she was entering the house. Barry was attacked after he came home. After the murders, the killer was alone in the house with the bodies, and there was no hurry to escape the scene. He removed or destroyed any evidence that he was there. The killer then took his time and staged the bodies to match the unusual sculpture. This was probably simply to confuse the police, but the killer may have been trying to frame Barry. He was almost successful with both of these goals. Now moving to my final thoughts. Barry Sherman was a ruthless businessman with a singular focus of accruing wealth. He was willing to offend anyone to have his way. Unfortunately, this lifestyle comes with certain risks. Barry could have managed these risks fairly well. He certainly had enough money for a security system, cameras, security guards, or other defensive measures. Despite acknowledging that several people wanted to kill him, Barry didn't even bother locking his doors. For someone who maintained a distrust of humanity, Barry should have distrusted a little bit more. Those are my thoughts in the case of Barry and Honey Sherman. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.